All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so at this point in calculus, we have begun to look at how to find the area of a region underneath the curve, such as this region right here under our function f of x from a to b. And we have seen how we can approximate this area by using rectangles, such as these right here. And so when we calculated the area of each of these rectangles and summed them together, we found an approximation of the area of that region underneath this curve. And notice that as we increased the number of rectangles that we used, that approximation got better and better until it became equal to the area of this region under the curve when the number of rectangles or n approached infinity. And so that gave us the formula that the area of that region is equal to the limit as n or the number of rectangles approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of the height of our rectangles f of x sub i times the width of our rectangles delta x. And so this is the formula for the limit definition of the area under the curve that allowed us to find the actual area of that region. And so it turns out that if we have a function like f of x here that is defined on an interval from a to b, and this limit exists for that function, then that function is said to be integrable on this interval from a to b. And so we would say that this area is equal to the integral of that function f of x dx. And it would be integrable from the lower bound a to the upper bound b. And so we write those bounds on our integral sign by putting our lower bound at the bottom and our upper bound at the top. And so this right here is what we call a definite integral, and it can be used to find the area of a region underneath a function on an interval from A to B. And so this connection between an integral or a definite integral and the area of a region underneath a curve is made possible by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that for a function f of x and its antiderivative capital F of x, the integral from a to b of the function f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative of that function evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. And so what this means is that if we were to integrate this function and find its antiderivative, meaning we would find the function whose derivative is this function, we can then plug in each of these bounds into that antiderivative and subtract the value when we plug in the lower bound, a, from the value when we plug in the upper bound b into our antiderivative. So we'd have capital F of b minus capital F of a. And so typically when we use this theorem, we have some nice notation that we use that for this integral from a to b of the function times dx, it's going to be equal to the antiderivative of that function evaluated from a to b. And that is still equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a, right? So these two equations are saying the same thing, except this one includes a middle step that provides some notation for us to use. And so for example, let's say we wanted to solve the definite integral from one to two of two x dx, right? Our function is going to be two x and our lower bound is one and our upper bound is two. And you could also call these the limits of integration. Two would be the upper limit of integration and one would be the lower limit. I'll typically call them the upper and lower bounds of integration, but they do have some other names as well. But if we were to go through and integrate this function, we wanna start by finding the antiderivative and then we'll evaluate it using the fundamental theorem of calculus here. And so this will be equal to two times x to the power of one plus one divided by one plus one. And then we're going to evaluate this from one to two, right? So we use the power rule for integration on our term two x here. We added one to our exponent of x. So we had the power of one, we added one and then divided by that new exponent one plus one. And so if you simplify, you'd have one plus one equals two in the denominator here. So this two and this two would cancel out. And so we'd just be left with this is equal to x squared evaluated from one to two. And so now we are at this part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? We found the antiderivative of our function x squared, and now we can plug in a and b and subtract the value of a plugged into the antiderivative from the antiderivative evaluated at b. And so in this case, this will be equal to two squared minus one squared, right? We plugged in two, our upper bound b, into this antiderivative x squared. So we have two squared, and then we're subtracting our lower bound one plugged into this antiderivative. 
So we have one squared. And so this is equal to two squared, which is four minus one squared, which is one, which means that this is equal to three. And so what that value means is that the area under this function, 2x, from the value of x equals one to x equals two is three. So this would be three square units of area. All right, and so that was our example of how we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, or at least the first part of it. But if you notice, when I found the antiderivative of our function here, right, when I found the integral of two x, we got x squared. But unlike when we did indefinite integration, I didn't add a plus c here. And let me show you why. If we clean up our work here, if we were to solve this integral again, but instead we included the plus c, watch what happens to that constant when we go through that evaluation, right? So our antiderivative will be x squared plus c, and we're going to evaluate that from one to two, but watch what happens when we plug each of our bounds into our antiderivative. This will be equal to two squared plus c minus one squared plus c. And so that would be equal to four plus c minus one minus c, right? One squared is one, and we distribute this negative to each part of this quantity. And so now we have a positive c and a negative c, and so those c's will cancel out. And so we still just have four minus one, which is equal to three. And so we found the same area. And so what you're going to notice is that constant of integration is not necessary when you are solving a definite integral. You still need it for an indefinite integral when you don't have bounds and you're just trying to find the antiderivative. But when you're trying to find a value of area, you don't need that constant of integration. All right, and so we will focus more on the process and the mechanics of evaluating definite integrals in our next lesson, where we really focus on definite integrals, because now we're going to want to move on to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, now that we have discussed the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so with that, let's move on to discussing that second part of the theorem. All right, and so the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus deals with the concept of expressing an integral as a function of x. And so let me show you what I mean. Let's say that you wanted to evaluate the following definite integrals. Let's say we had the integral from zero to pi over two of cosine x dx, and then we wanna find the integral from zero to pi divided by three of cosine x dx. And then let's say we also wanted to find the integral from zero to pi divided by four of cosine x dx. Now we could go through and evaluate each of these integrals individually, or we could save some time and rewrite these integrals as one integral where our upper bound is equal to x. And so let me show you what I mean. Let's say that instead of having the integral from zero to pi over two, or the integral from zero to pi over three or pi over four, we have the integral from zero to x of the function cosine, but I'm gonna switch the variable here to t. That way we don't get this value of x confused with the variable that our function is defined with. And so we're gonna switch it to cosine of t dt. We're just gonna integrate with respect to t instead. It doesn't change this function, it's just defined with t rather than x. And then we're going to want to evaluate this integral when x is equal to pi over two pi over three and pi over four, right? This integral represents these three integrals where x is equal to each of those values that were in our upper bounds. And so if we were to evaluate this integral using the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, this would be equal to the integral of cosine t, which we know that the integral of cosine is going to be sine, so we're gonna have sine t, and that's going to be evaluated from zero to x. And so if we plug in x and zero into our antiderivative or into this function here, sine of t, we'll have that this is equal to sine of x minus sine of zero. And we know that sine of zero is equal to zero, so this is just going to be equal to sine x. And so now this is the answer to this definite integral from zero to x, and now we can plug in our values of x of pi over two, pi over three, and pi over four into this function to find out what the answer to these definite integrals would be. And so if you did want to know the answer to these integrals, you could go ahead and plug in each of these x values into sine x to find their respective values, but that's actually not the focus here because notice that this function here, sine x, is equal to the antiderivative of our function evaluated at x, right? If we go back to our integral over here where we have cosine of t, in this case, cosine of t would be equal to f of t, right? 
that would be our function of the variable t. And so that means that the antiderivative, or capital F of t, is equal to sine t, right? That is what we have over here. The first part of your definite integral process is that you find the antiderivative of this function. And in this case, that antiderivative, or capital F of t, is sine t, which is right here. And so that means that if we have sine of x, that this would be equal to that antiderivative evaluated at x, right? If we plug x into this function, we have sine x. And so this is the idea of the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If the antiderivative capital F of x is equal to the integral from some lower bound a to x of a function f of t dt, then that means that the derivative of that antiderivative is going to be equal to f of x. And so if we clean up our work here a little bit, another way that we could express this is going to be the actual definition of the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and that is that the derivative d dx of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is equal to f of x. Right, so these two statements are saying the same thing. So in our case up here, cosine of t was f of t, and we found that when we evaluated this integral, we got sine x, which is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at x, which is right here, right? The antiderivative evaluated at x, which means that the derivative of this antiderivative, right? The derivative of sine x would be f of x or cosine of x, right? So in our scenario here, f of x would be equal to cosine x because the derivative of sine x, which is capital F of x, is equal to cosine x. All right, and so let's look at some more examples where we use this definition here for the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so for our first example here, we have the derivative with respect to x of this integral from zero to x of the square root of t squared plus three dt. And we wanna know what this is equal to. And so the first thing that we're going to do in order to have this match up better with our definition for the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is we're going to take the inside of our integral known as the integrand, right? This function right here, and we're gonna set it equal to f of t. So our function f of t is equal to the square root of t squared plus three. And so if we rewrite this, we'll have that this is equal to the derivative of the integral from zero to x of f of t dt. And so then thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that this will then be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative of f of t evaluated from zero to x, right? So the integral of this function or the antiderivative would be capital F of t, and we're still going to evaluate it from zero to x. And so if we evaluate this, this will be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative evaluated at x minus the antiderivative evaluated at zero. And so now if we're gonna take the derivative of each of these terms, let's note something about each of them first. And that is that for this f of zero or our antiderivative evaluated at zero, this is just going to be a constant, right? And so we can say that the derivative of this term will be zero. And then how about our antiderivative? Well, if this is the antiderivative, that means that if we take the derivative of it, we will get the original function. And so this will be equal to lowercase f of x, our original function, minus zero, which means that this is equal to f of x, right? And so if we wanna know the answer to this specific example, we just have to plug x into our function up here, f of t. And so that means that f of x, or x plugged into this function, will be equal to the square root of x squared plus three. And so that would be the final answer to this problem. And so now maybe you look back to the original statement of this problem and you see that, oh, it looks like we just plugged x into the integrand and that was our answer. So why did we do all of this extra work? Well, one, to see how to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And then two, it's not always going to be that easy. And so let me show you what I mean with our next example. All right, so here we have the derivative of the integral from x to two of the square root of t squared plus seven dt. And so if we go through this problem like we did the previous one, we'll start by letting f of t equal our integrand, which is the square root of t squared plus seven, right? That is what is inside our integral here. And so if we rewrite our problem, we'll have that this is equal to d dx, or the derivative of the integral from x to two of f of t dt. And so then if we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, this will be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative f of t evaluated from x to two. 
And so then if we evaluate this antiderivative from x to 2, this will be equal to the derivative d dx of the antiderivative evaluated at 2 minus the antiderivative evaluated at x. And so in this case, if we're going to take the derivative of these two terms, f of 2 is just going to be a constant, right? Just like f of 0 was in our previous example, this is not defined with x. It's going to be a constant. So the derivative of that constant will be 0. But then we're going to have minus the derivative of our antiderivative. And so we'll have that this is equal to 0 minus the original function f of x. And that will be equal to negative f of x. And so in this case, the final answer to this problem will be this function, f of t, evaluated at x and negated. So our answer here is that negative f of x is equal to negative square root of x squared plus 7. And so this would be the final answer to this problem. And so before we end this lesson, there's one more example I want to look at that's going to involve a little bit more work than our previous examples here. And you'll see what I mean as we get into the problem. So let's do that next. So here we have the derivative of the integral from 3 to x squared of the function t squared minus 9 quantity squared dt. And so how are we going to go about this problem? Because now notice that our upper bound isn't just x, it's x squared. Well, we'll worry about that when we get to the point where we evaluate our antiderivative on each of our bounds. But let's start by just letting f of t equal t squared minus 9 squared, right? We're just letting our integrand equal f of t. And so that means if we rewrite this, we'll have the derivative of the integral from 3 to x squared of f of t dt. And then if we evaluate this integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus, this will be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative capital F of t evaluated from 3 to x squared. And so now if we go through with this evaluation, this will be equal to the derivative or d dx of f of x squared minus f of 3. All right, and so in this case, we're going to be taking a derivative of this term and this term. And so just like in our previous examples, f of 3 is just going to be a constant. So the derivative of this term is just 0. So we can just forget about that. We don't need to worry about that term. But how about the derivative of the antiderivative, capital F, of x squared? What are we going to do for this term? Well, we have to remember one of our derivative rules of the chain rule, right? Because we have an outside function of the antiderivative and an inside function of x squared. Now, we technically were using the chain rule before, but the inside term was x, and so the derivative of x is just 1, and so it didn't matter then, but it does matter now because the derivative of the inside of this function is not just 1. And so the derivative here is not just going to be small f of x squared. We then need to multiply by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, right? We multiply down the exponent and then subtract 1 from the exponent to get 2x, right? Because when we were taking a derivative before, or d dx of capital F of x, that was equal to small f of x times the derivative of x, which is just 1. And so it was just equal to f of x. But in this case, it wasn't just x, so we needed to account for that and use the chain rule. And so if we want to know the answer to this problem, we need to plug x squared into our function and then multiply it by 2x. And so f of x squared is equal to x squared squared minus 9 squared. And that will be equal to x to the fourth power minus 9 squared. And so then if we plug this in for f of x squared, then our final answer here is going to be this 2x times this function up here. So we're going to have 2x times x to the fourth power minus 9 squared. And so that would be the final answer to this problem. And so be careful when one of your bounds is not just x, but is another function. It could be sine x, it could be x cubed. It doesn't matter if it's not x, you need to account for the chain rule when you take the derivative of that antiderivative evaluated for that function. All right, and so with that, that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more example problems that use the fundamental theorem of calculus, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.